Okay, so um, welcome to our Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium for March. Um, my name is uh, Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a professor of medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital and a, and a director of the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law, um, and also a faculty member of the Center for Bioethics. And with my uh, co-organizer, uh, Leah Rand, I want to thank everybody for joining us today for um, what I uh, what I know will be a very interesting um, and extremely timely discussion about uh, about the ACA and uh, and, and national health coverage. Um, just as a, an overall reminder, um, you can submit any question, uh, questions uh, at any time you want and using the Q&A feature, um, and we're going to hopefully reserve about, uh, about 20, 25 minutes or so at the end to try to address, um, address your questions. So please start getting those in and we can start, uh, start queuing them up. Um, if you want to talk about uh, or tweet at all about the, this event as it's going on, um, you can use the hashtag, um, hashtag policy ethics. Meanwhile, we're also um, live streaming on Facebook as well. Um, so you can also uh, have a conversation in, uh, through that portal. Um, if you have any technical issues, um, do let us know. And if you are interested in this series, please um, check out the, the bioethics uh, website and you can subscribe there. Uh, you can also reach us at the um, uh, portal website uh, at portalresearch.org. Um, as always, the goals of the consortium are to try to articulate key issues in the healthcare system. Um, that involve ethically challenging policies or practices, bring together experts with different perspectives and experiences to continue um, to consider and propose solutions and to stimulate um, conversation and, uh, and, and academic study to, to advance the field. And um, I'm really uh, extremely excited about the um, experts uh, that, we've got, uh, that we've got today. Just to look ahead, um, we're, we're gonna be talking about equitable care for incarcerated individuals in April. Um, so you can uh, put that on your calendar and even, as I said, register early um, on, the, on the Center for Bioethics website. Um, so today's session uh, is about the ACA in the 2020s. Um, and what I'm gonna, I just wanna uh, introduce our moderator for today and uh, Michael will provide some additional context and then um, introduce our, our expert discussions. Um, Michael Sinha, our moderator, um, is a physician, a lawyer and a public health expert um, who is a fellow at the Harvard uh, MIT Center for Regulatory Science and teaches public health law at Northeastern, um, and is uh, a great uh, a great colleague and and knows a lot about a lot of different stuff and is going to help uh, introduce today's topic. Um, Michael, thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, pull this up. All right. So, uh, in on March 23rd, uh, 2010, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was passed and signed into law by President Barack Obama. You see here at the signing ceremony. Um, since then, um, a lot has changed, but uh, the ACA was really. Uh, one of the landmark uh, healthcare reforms, uh, really in, in terms of uh, reducing the un uninsured rate in the United States uh, since the creation of Medicare and Medicaid in the mid 1960s. Now, since it was signed into law, uh, the uninsured rate has dropped uh, fairly dramatically. It reached a peak of about 18% just after it was. Uh, put into place and dropped to uh, just below 11%. Um, since the election of President Donald Trump in 2016, uh, the law has faced uh, uh, challenges. Uh, it's also faced a series of court challenges, and you'll see that the uninsured rate has been trickling up in the last couple of years. Um, this was uh, the repeal effort. Um, and these are a series of bills that were proposed in uh, the U.S. House and Senate trying to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act in whole. Um, uh, the current law here, uh, you see that still there are 28 million people at the time that were uninsured. Um, repealing of the mandates, which actually did happen under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, potentially was going to add 15 million people to the uninsured docket by 2026. And then you see a variety of bills here that were proposed 
by a Republican-led Senate uh, seeking to overhaul and repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, this is the famous 1.29 a.m. thumbs down from uh, the late Senator John McCain on July 28, 2017. Uh, this essentially put a stop uh, to any major efforts from the Republican Party to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Now, this doesn't mean that the act didn't face a considerable legal challenge. Um, it faced its first legal challenge in the Supreme Court in NFIB v. Sebelius in 2012. In that case, uh, the individual mandate was upheld essentially as a tax, uh, but the Medicaid expansion, which was initially uh, sketched into the law as a mandate, uh, became an optional uh, decision for states. And so this really shaped the way uh, the ACA has been implemented in the last uh, several years. Uh, the Burwell v. Hobby Lobby case uh, allowed closely held corporations to be exempt from contraception rules. King v. Burwell uh, was upheld. Uh, there was a question of whether tax subsidies in states with federal insurance exchanges uh, could be upheld. Uh, really, it came down to a technicality in language in the case. Uh, U.S. House versus Burwell, Price, and then Azar uh, questioned and challenged subsidies for cost-sharing reductions. Uh, this case was eventually settled. And then finally, we have a case that's pending before the Supreme Court right now in California v. Texas, looking at whether the individual mandate um, is, is a core element of the entire Affordable Care Act, and the fact that the penalty in the ACA has essentially been zeroed out, does that render the individual mandate ineffective and therefore render the entire law invalid? So this is a lot uh, forthcoming. Um, so I'd like to start here and introduce our esteemed guests. Uh, we are lucky in the Zoom era to be able to recruit guests from across the U.S., uh, some extremely talented folks like our speakers today. Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Jonathan Oberlander, who is Professor and Chair of Social Medicine and Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He also holds an adjunct appointment in the Department of Political Science. His research and teaching interests include healthcare politics and policy, healthcare reform, Medicare, and American politics and public policy. Dr. Oberlander is author of The Political Life of Medicare and co-author of the two-volume series, The Social Medicine Reader, Third Edition. His recent work explores ongoing political fights over and implementation of the Affordable Care Act, healthcare cost control, Medicare reform, and the fate of the Children's Health Insurance Program and Independent Payment Advisory Board. Our second speaker is Professor Aaron Fuse Brown, who is an Associate Professor of Law, the Kathy C. Henson Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Health Law, for Law, Health, and Society at Georgia State University School of Law in Atlanta. Professor Fuse Brown's area of research and expertise include health law and policy, healthcare finance, the regulation of healthcare markets and competition, the Affordable Care Act, single payer and public option health reforms, ERISA preemption of state health laws, consumer financial protections for patients, healthcare consolidation and prices, and surprise medical bills. Professor Fuse Brown is one of five new casebook authors for the eighth edition of Health Law, published in 2018 by West Academic. Her scholarship has been published in top-tier law, health law, and medical journals, and she is co-author of a terrific new article titled Health Reform Reconstruction. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Oberlander. All right. Thank you very much. And it's great to be with you all. I'm going to try and um, share a screen here. See. So um, those of us who have been living our lives on Zoom, and I know that's many of us, I'm going to have to really resist the temptation to just stop talking and put you all in the breakout rooms. But 
Um, I, I will try not to do that. Um, so I want to uh, start off with the um, observation that we have had for the last decade a partisan war over uh, health care reform in the United States, a partisan war over the Affordable Care Act. And it has been fought in Congress. It has been fought, as you just heard, in the courts repeatedly. And it has been fought often, though not always, um, in the states. When the Affordable Care Act was enacted uh, nearly 11 years ago, uh, that was not, I think, the uh, certainly not the intention of the advocacy of the Affordable Care Act. And I think a lot of folks like me who um, observe American healthcare policy would not have predicted what the next decade would look like. Um, when the Affordable Care Act was enacted, it was very much regarded as a starter home. It had limitations it had problems. There were aspects of the Affordable Care Act that clearly were going to need improvement over time. And the architects of the Affordable Care Act had good reason to believe that they would get those kind of improvements. Generally in political science, what we teach our students is when you enact a program that's a broad program and has diffuse benefits, as people get those benefits, the program becomes more popular. It builds a political constituency the whatever controversy surrounded the program tends to fade away from its enactment and it really becomes institutionalized. Um, that was certainly the case if you think about Medicare back in uh, 1965. Medicare, there was a bitter debate um, over the enactment of Medicare. It took um, over a decade to enact Medicare in Congress. It was a partisan debate. It was an ideological debate. But after Medicare was enacted, there was no longer a question of were we going to have a Medicare program. We still talked about what should Medicare look like? What should its benefits be? How should we control costs? But the question about should there be Medicare was closed, essentially, after 1965. And Medicare became remarkably popular and in some ways developed a bipartisan constituency in Congress. That has not been the path of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so as a result, the um, expectation that over time the Affordable Care Act would be improved, that it would be strengthened, that it would be reformed, really did not come to pass in the last decade. Likewise, um, Republicans also had an aspiration about Obamacare, but it was the opposite. Uh, right from the get-go, uh, the ink was not dry and they were already talking about repealing and replacing. Obamacare, and uh, they have fought over the last decade to try and do just that. Um, and when Donald Trump was elected president in 2016 and had Republican majorities in the House and the Senate in 2017, it seemed to many like this was going to be the end of Obamacare. But it turned out that repeal was trickier than a lot of people thought. They were unable to repeal the law, and it continued on. So if you think about the last decade, the way I would put it is the politics of stalemate have governed the Affordable Care Act in the last decade. Democrats have not gotten what they hoped, which is to build on the law, to expand the law, to reform the law, to strengthen the law. And Republicans have not gotten what they wanted either. They have not been able to repeal the law in any meaningful sense. It's still standing. So really, um, both parties have been frustrated over the last decade, and that has led to a stalemate. And the Affordable Care Act in 2020 looked not exactly, but largely like it did when it was passed in 2010. The question is, with the election of Joe Biden and the Biden administration coming to power in 2021, what do the new politics of healthcare reform look like? Have we broken the stalemate? What is the trajectory of uh, the politics of healthcare around the Affordable Care Act and more broadly? So I just want to say a word about what the um, Biden administration uh, faces. And as uh, you just saw a couple minutes ago, in, in some respects, the Affordable Care Act is a great success. Uh, about 20 million people gained insurance coverage from the time the Affordable Care Act uh, was enacted. Um, and given everything that's gone on with the law, all kinds of problems, some of them self-imposed, all the opposition to the law, all the confusion about the law, that is a substantial gain in insurance coverage in a short period of time. So that's the good news. The bad news is 
there's only one rich democracy in the world where I could appear on Zoom and say, I've got great news. We've got about 30 million people who are uninsured. And that's the United States of America. Um, Obamacare certainly has not been universal, really was not designed to be universal. And as you can see, um, uh, we still have tens of millions of people in this country who don't have any health insurance. And as Michael just pointed out, we have actually had an increase in the uninsured population even before COVID hit. And that really is disturbing because in these years from 2016 to 2019, the economy was in good shape. And generally when the economy is in good shape, the uninsured population does not go up. And of course, um, now with COVID, we expect that the uninsured population has grown over the last year. So in short, um, we've made a lot of progress in making health insurance more accessible in the United States, but we've got a long, long way to go. I can show you lots of um, statistics and put you to sleep just like I put my students to sleep um, every week on Zoom. But instead I wanted to um, show you a couple stories because you can pick up a newspaper uh, and that sounded kind of antiquated 20th century. You can uh, scroll through a newspaper on your phone um, and uh, any week and, and find these kind of stories. And you know, the New York Times has been running a series with Sarah uh, Cliff who's terrific about um, billing uh, in American healthcare. And this is a story that just appeared a couple days ago, actually. And it's about a guy, uh, John Drushitz, um, out of Texas, who um, exhibited symptoms that seemed consistent with COVID, as you can see, um, in April, so early, early on um, in the pandemic. And there was, uh, you know, mixed results on his lab, some test positive, some tests negative, but he had uh, an irregular heartbeat, he had blood clots in his lungs. They sent him home on oxygen, um, and, but didn't give him the um, coronavirus diagnosis because of some of those negative tests. Well, it turns out that because they didn't give him the um, coronavirus diagnosis, the hospital couldn't access the special federal funds that would pay for that case. And so he later on received a bill of over $22,000 for his time in the hospital. Um, and um, this is a mistake, by the way, I should say he was 64 years old, not 66. So he was, um, he was literally just a little bit away from qualifying for Medicare. And so the, this story is one of the many stories we hear in American medical care that should not happen. In one of the richest countries in the world, something like this should never happen. It makes no sense that somebody paid a $22,000 bill or was charged $22,000 because of a diagnostic code. That makes no sense. It makes no sense that um, this man would face this kind of bill because he was just short of Medicare eligibility. But, um, you know, um, 23 days uh, uh, later, he would have been eligible for Medicare. That makes no sense. And it really speaks to the um, insanity um, of our non-system in the United States. One other piece of the story that I wanted to mention, he had private insurance through the Affordable Care Act, but because he was starting Medicare, he canceled that insurance. And it turned out he made a mistake and canceled it one month early. And that's where, when he got COVID. And it really speaks to the experiences that unfortunately lots of uninsured Americans have, um, and many Americans who are underinsured as well. Um, COVID has highlighted a lot of things about American healthcare and a lot of things that aren't Good. And so here's another story from a few months ago um, out in California. And there were hospitals when COVID was overwhelming a lot of hospitals. There were hospitals that wanted to transfer their patients to hospitals in Los Angeles who had more resources, had more beds, and weren't being overwhelmed at that time um, in the same way. And in some cases, those hospitals refused to take the COVID patients because they were on Medicaid or because they were uninsured. Uh, there is nothing more you really need to know about the moral illogic of U.S. healthcare, and I know this is a bioethics seminar, than, than this slide. Um, lots of countries were overwhelmed uh, with COVID. Countries with universal healthcare systems, like the United Kingdom, um, like France, like Italy, but there's no country that I know of, um, no rich democracy at least, that had hospitals that were refusing COVID patients because of their insurance status. That is a uniquely American problem and it's a reflection of what we have. And um, you think about it, we're over a decade into the Affordable Care Act 
And while we've made lots of progress in covering people, the sort of um, fundamental values that underlie our system are, are still not really where they should be. They, they really aren't. So what has Biden um, done so far? And I think Aaron is gonna um, talk about some of this uh, maybe in a little more detail. So I'm not gonna uh, um, spend a lot of time on this, but you know, President Biden is using a lot of executive orders, taking a lot of executive actions. That's a trend in uh, the presidency and it's a trend in the presidency because presidents have a hard time getting everything, anything through Congress. So President Trump did the same except in the other direction. And essentially when you, when you look at these, um, what Biden is trying to do in some sense is undo damage that the Trump administration um, tried to cause to the Affordable Care Act. And you know, the Trump administration did not want the Affordable Care Act to work. Um, and they tried to do things to set up a self-fulfilling prophecy, um, to weaken the law in certain ways. And then that would allow them to say, look, it isn't working. So um, the Biden administration wants to see if they can actually make the law work. And so they've taken a number of steps um, including opening back up the Affordable Care Act marketplaces and reinstating advertising and so on and so forth um, to try and make it work, undoing some of the policies from the Trump administration to restrict access um, to health insurance. And we may see some additional action as well down the line via um, executive order and regulation. There is a law that just passed this week um, and um, the, you know this law had a lot in it, but it had healthcare provisions that I wanted to mention just briefly that are um, really important. And you know, th this law really represents the first significant improvement to the Affordable Care Act in over a decade. This is the first time Congress has passed a law that really strengthens the Affordable Care Act since it was enacted in 2010. And the Affordable Care Act's got a lot of problems. Um, there are Lot, millions of Americans who can't afford coverage under the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act's a really good deal if you are low income and live in a state that expanded Medicaid um, or you qualify for subsidies. But if you're not low income and if you don't live in a state that expanded Medicaid and if you're middle class, the Affordable Care Act is not such a great deal. And um, really the policies that have been available to people are high deductible, high premium policies that really are unaffordable. So um, what, what, what they've done in this law is first of all, to try and patch um, some of the um, bleeding, so to speak, that the health insurance system is experiencing right now. We have an employer-based insurance system uh, because of the lockdown, because of the pandemic, because of the recession, millions of people lost their jobs and many of those people lost their health insurance. So. Um, they're going to subsidize COBRA, which is a program that allows people to stay on their employer coverage. The other things that you um, see here in the next few bullet points are really aimed to address that affordability issue with the Affordable Care Act, to make it more affordable, to make it more affordable for the middle class, to make it more affordable for lower income Americans, and um, to try and get it so more people are able to sign up for coverage. And this is a big deal. This is a, a really important step. Um, there's also an effort to try and offer states that have not expanded Medicaid, there are about a dozen nationally, including my own here in North Carolina, to try and offer them some new financial carrots if they do that. And finally, I just wanna mention this um, briefly because it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Um, there is a expansion in the law of postpartum coverage for um, pregnant women under Medicaid uh, right now can only get that coverage for two months. Uh, that's gonna go up to a year, which is incredibly important given the problem we have in the United States uh, with maternal mortality. Note that these provisions are time limited. The ACA provisions are temporary. They're only for two years, which is something I'll come back to a little later. We also have, um, as Michael mentioned, um, um, another name that I call the Affordable Care Act is the Lawyer Full Employment Act of 2010. I hope my health law colleagues don't mind that, but there's just one case after another going on here. And we've got this case, uh, as you just heard, hanging over the law. And we expect any day now, any week now, that the Supreme Court's gonna rule. And it's, it's um, tough business trying to guess what the Supreme Court is gonna do. But based on the oral arguments, I think um, there is a lot of expectation that the Supreme Court is gonna turn down um, the, the um, case brought by Republican governed states and they're gonna uphold 
um, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act. Um, if they don't uphold it, then we're gonna have to have a whole nother seminar because um, total chaos is gonna break out. So if we take those two things, the fact that we just got this ACA 2.0 legislation, I'll call it this week, this ACO patch legislation, and we're likely, not guaranteed, but likely to get a ruling from the Supreme Court that turns back another legal challenge to the law, um, I think it's worth asking if we're about to enter a new era in the politics of healthcare in the United States and the politics of the Affordable Care Act. Is the war, the decade-long war over Obamacare, is it about to end. Um, in addition to those two developments, there are other reasons why you might say the war is essentially over. One is Republicans had a chance to repeal it. They couldn't do it. And um, even when they had majorities in Congress. And since then, it has not animated the Republican Party the same way. The, the, the issue doesn't have the same resonance that it did um, five, six, seven, years ago, and Republicans still face the same political problem, which is you can't repeal without replace, and they don't have replace. There is no agreed upon Republican replace plan. Meanwhile, the law has been gaining in popularity, thanks in part to efforts to repeal it. It's how now we're a decade into the law, tens of millions of people are beneficiaries of the law. The law is more popular than it's been um, and that you know that changes the politics. So um, can we say that the Obamacare wars are essentially over? Well, if they are, it would mean that the Affordable Care Act has had a delayed progression. The natural progression of programs, even ones that are controversial like Medicare, as I mentioned before, is after they're enacted, we move into a politics really of rationalization and reform, and we think about how to fix them, how to reform them, we fight about them, but we don't think about repealing them. Um, is the Affordable Care Act headed in that same trajectory now? Um, and I think the answer to that is sort of. I think the existential war over Obamacare, it could be that that's about to end. In other words, the, the fight over whether we're gonna have this at all or not. Um, we're not, I think ever rolling back the clock to 2009. It's too late for that. It's, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, and I think as, as long as the court ruling goes the way that people expect that you would probably be on solid ground to say that the existential war over Obamacare is over. But I don't think that means that all the conflict over the ACA is over. Remember, we still have a dozen states that have not expanded Medicaid and lots of battles at the state level to come. Um, over expanding Medicaid. Um, if you think about the political alignment right now, Democratic president, small Democratic majority in the House, even a thinner Democratic majority in the Senate, those will change. And what would happen if you got a Republican majority in Congress in 2023 or a Republican majority in Congress in 2025 and a Republican president in 2025? Uh, I think there's a good chance they would go after the Affordable Care Act, not to repeal it entirely, because I don't think that'll be possible, but to weaken it, go after it through regulation, go after it with legislation where possible. But in, in, in other words, instead of an existential war, a war of attrition. And I think that's likely where we're headed. And so I wanna explain why, why is it that we just can't get past this conflict over the Affordable Care Act? This is a um, really popular chart in political science. As you can tell from that, we don't have a lot going on with our lives, really. So um, what this is showing you is a, an, a scale of ideology in the House of Representatives over time. So up is conservative, down is liberal. So the average of Republicans is higher up, meaning they're a more conservative party than Democrats are. Political scientists excel at telling you obvious things in really complicated ways. What I want you to pay attention to is what has happened since the 1980s. By this measure, and not just this measure, there are other measures that so show the same thing. Republicans in the House of Representatives um, have become a much more ideologically conservative party. And Democrats have become a bit more liberal party. The result is we have this chasm, this ideological gap between the parties. And it's bigger than any point we can measure even in the 1870s after the Civil War. So if you wanna know why we fought over Obamacare in the last decade and why that fight 
just has not seemed to want to end. If you want to know why we've had all these court cases, many of which are more about the politics than the law, um, it's this. It's because the parties are so far apart ideologically right now. And um, really, a lot of the fight about the Affordable Care Act is not about health care. It's a um, reflection of the broader division in American politics. This is another political science chart. Once I, once I start, I'm just not gonna stop with these. Okay, so here's another chart in political science. This one's a little more complicated. This is showing you, this is by Francis Lee, University of Maryland. It's showing you um, by decade, how competitive are national elections. So if we go right here on this axis, even would mean each party is getting about 50% of the share of the vote. So you can see in the 1880s, um, elections were very competitive. Now, when you see one of these columns up high, that means a party was dominating. So um, um, Abraham Lincoln, the Republican Party, obviously dominated in, to, in the 1860s, Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. So in other words, Democrats dominated not just the presidency, but elections for the House and Senate. Take a look at the last three decades. See this here? close to the axis, what this is telling you is we have had the most competitive, the closest series of elections for the presidency and majority control of the House and Senate in US history. And there are a lot of political scientists like Francis Lee who believe that when you have super competitive elections, it increases polarization between the parties. That polarization that I just showed you was ideological. This is about power because if a party believes it can win a majority control or the presidency in the next election, it has a greater incentive not to cooperate with the party that's in power right now, but to do everything they can to stop them so they can get back in the majority because they can see it in reach. In other words, there's an incentive not to be bipartisan and that may be driven by the close elections that we're having. That Growing partisan division is seen, um, especially in the Senate. You know, the Senate in a lot of ways has become ungovernable. It has become a 60 vote Senate. There was a time when the filibuster, we talk about the, you know, the um, filibuster being used to block civil rights legislation, which it certainly was um, in the 1960s. But um, look at the overall, the use of the filibuster in the 1960s and look where we are now. Look where we are now. Um, the Senate has become a supermajority institution um, ungovernable in many respects. And that is again, a reflection of the partisan divisions um, uh, in Congress. One other um, slide I wanna show you, uh, this is split ticket voting. So if you have somebody who votes for a president of one party and a member of the House of Representatives from another party. So if they voted for Joe Biden for president and a Republican for the House, that's what we call split ticket voting. Split ticket voting was the norm in American politics. I mean, if you look back here not too long ago, it wasn't unusual for 30 or 40% of the House to be from the opposite party of the president. You see where it is after the 2020 elections? There are currently only 16 members out of 435 in the House who were elected in a district that voted um, for the opposite. In other words, a Democrat um, where a district voted for a Republican or vice versa. We are down to 16 in the House and only six in the Senate. And so the parties have become more homogenous over time. They've become more polarized over time. And it, again, makes it very hard to have any kind of um, bipartisan compromise. It's not just what I've shown you is about Congress. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that we've had this polarization and ideological polarization, a partisan polarization among members of Congress, but it's not just about Congress, it's about the public. This is how do you view the Affordable Care Act? And look up here, um, this is just from um, um, a year ago, you can see 80% of Democrats like the Affordable Care Act, 20% of Republicans. So um, the perception of the Affordable Care Act varies greatly by partisanship. And if I had time, I'd show you a whole bunch of other slides that would show you that increasingly Democrats take a very dim view of Republicans and Republicans take a very dim view of publics. Again, speaking to the fact that this polarization is not just a congressional polarization. Um, we in fact have seen it. We're seeing it right now in COVID. And, and this is a tragedy. It's an American tragedy because we, you know, a public health emergency should not have been a public uh, partisan issue, but it has been. You see it um, in the attitudes towards vaccination. 
You see it from this survey that was done earlier this year about concern over COVID, social distancing, masking, et cetera, very different views, blue and red, very different views between Democrats and Republicans. Um, we don't live in the United States of America right now. We live in a very divided country and that is a problem. It has meant in terms of healthcare politics that there has been no bipartisanship essentially on Obamacare. There have been a few issues in the last decade where Democrats and Republicans agreed to subtract to get rid of things that were controversial or unpopular or the healthcare industry didn't like, but there's been no bipartisanship, none on adding to the Affordable Care Act. And so I think that what that tells you um, going forward, um, coming out of the Rescue Act is, um, well, maybe the existential war on Obamacare is, is ending, but um, it's gonna be really hard to go towards a bipartisan politics around the Affordable Care Act anytime soon. What about the rest of Joe Biden's agenda? Um, so, uh, and we can talk more about this in Q&A. Of course, he had aspirations in his plan when he was running for president about creating a new Medicare-like public option, expanding Medicare eligibility down to age 60. That's gonna be really hard to do, um, really, really hard to do, um, and largely because of the Senate. And I don't think this is primarily about the filibuster, um, which is a convenient scapegoat, uh, sometimes from majority parties, it's because Democrats have a majority of 50 plus Vice President Harris. And if you want to enact a public option or if you want to expand Medicare eligibility, you've either got to get Joe Manchin and Senator Sinema on your side, or you've got to pick off a couple of moderate Republicans like Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. So the sort of bolder part of um, Joe Biden's agenda for the next two years, it's gonna be really difficult to um, pursue that. Keep your eyes on expanding Medicare eligibility, which, which, which probably has a, a bit more public lay, a bit more political legs in the short term than um, the public option does. Beyond 22, 2022, you know, um, then we start talking about what is the future of healthcare reform? Um, and we're talking about a new Congress and eventually a new president. And I think it gets very, very murky. We can talk about um, Medicare for all, which um, has a lot of policy advantages and an equal number, if not more political disadvantages. But um, the point I would make to you is it's really hard to know what's gonna come next. I mean, the last decade was certainly a surprise in many ways. And I think right now sitting here in 2021, um, um, hopefully at the light of the end of the tunnel of this pandemic, really hard to say where we're gonna be politically in 2023, 2024, let alone a decade from now. So I think um, we're at an inflection point in um, the politics of healthcare. We're likely to see transformation in the politics of the Affordable Care Act. But beyond that, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Great, thank you, Jonathan. That was um, a really fantastic overview, both in terms of the history of uh, the Affordable Care Act, as well as a, a, a hazy forecast as to where we're going. And I pretty much agree with everything Jonathan said. So in some ways, there's not gonna be a lot of debate back and forth in terms of his assessment and my assessment um, of where things are going. And I and I think that in some ways, I just wanna pick up on some themes that, you know, the, that we can talk about a little bit further. So one of the things that we are trying to gauge, right, as a public, is what is the Bi what is health policy going to look like under the Biden administration? And what it's still early days, right? The Biden administration has been very busy, however, on the policy front, um, and even setting aside the pandemic, uh, which of course is taking up most of the energy uh, in terms of policy. How should we think about what the administration has already done and what that signals for what we can imagine the Biden administration might lead or head in the future? Uh, what do we think we should, where do we think we should go from here? So it may be a bit cute, but I, when I reflect upon uh, President Biden's health policy moves, you know, it's only been 51 days since he took office, you can see some themes and I cluster these into certain categories. One, like, um, Jonathan, I think about it in terms of the things that the Biden administration had to do just to restore and reverse whatever the damage the Trump administration had done, both to the Affordable Care Act, but also just to healthcare markets overall. And then the second category would be steps affirmatively taken to reinforce 
the functioning of the healthcare market to make it more affordable. And that I think a lot of what we saw in the American Rescue Plan that was passed this week would fall into this category, but there've been some other efforts as well. And I'll talk about those. And then there's the less talked about um, things that the Biden administration might retain, right? It's not, you know, it's, there's not a whole lot of things that fall into this category, but there are some um, policy moves of the Trump administration that I don't know whether or not the Biden administration is going to reverse it or replace it with something else or whether it's going to keep it and build on it for the future. And then finally, there's what kinds of reforms can we hope or expect to see out of the Biden administration? And I largely agree with Jonathan here that there's it's a really tough road. So we may not actually see much more in the, in the way of reform, but what could we imagine would be some paths forward? So on that first category, you know, a lot of the president's initial moves, including all of the executive orders he signed in the first week or first couple of weeks in office and statements of enforcement policies were all steps to reverse the bleeding, right? To staunch the bleeding, to reverse Trump administration policies. And many of these changes are the ones that could be initiated by the executive branch unilaterally. They did not require congressional action. And this is because, you know, if you think about it, Trump actually did very little health policy through Congress. Um, you know, again, other than the 2017 failed effort to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, almost all of the health policy that the Trump administration did was through executive action, either through executive order or through administrative rules or guidance or other sort of administrative um, documents. And these are all things that can be re reversed by a subsequent administration. So the speed at which a prior policy can be reversed really depends on the whether, you know, the form of that prior policy. So if it's an executive order, well, that can be, you know, erased in one stroke of a pen by a, by a subsequent administration. Um, same thing with guidance documents. Those can just be, you know, replaced by a new guidance document, a new memo stating policy of enforcement, for example. However, if it's a rule, like a regular a regulation that was issued through notice and comment rulemaking process, uh, a president, an agency can't, you know, a president can't just announce that the rule doesn't exist anymore through an executive order. The agency has to go through a notice and comment rulemaking process to rescind an existing rule. So the same process that you need to, to put a pla in place a new rule or amend a new rule, um, you actually have to use that same process to, re to rescind it. So if they're, you know, the, the executive orders, a lot of them, took the form of instructions to the agency. And that's fairly typical. That's usually how executive orders are used in the sense that they are really marching orders to the agencies to take a look at the rules, to follow certain policy priorities um, and to take certain steps to effectuate eventual policy. It doesn't make, they're not self-executing in the sense that they don't uh, make those new policies come into be overnight. So we saw a lot of that type of action. Um, one of the first things that, that the, the Biden administration did was to freeze Trump administration's midnight rules, meaning the rules that went into that had been finalized but had not yet gone into effect. This is very typical whenever an administration changes parties. It gives the new administration time to re, you know, review them, see which ones they want to start to unwind and which ones they want to adopt. It also gives the Congress time to use the Congressional Review Act to maybe undo uh, problematic rules as well. So it is that's typical, but all it does is it delays the effective date of these, you know, this category of rule for another 60 days. One of the biggest things that the Trump administration uh, had done to really undermine some of the gains in the Affordable Care Act uh, was to really reinterpret what Medicaid meant by allowing states to apply for and secure approval for Medicaid work requirements. And of course, uh, this became a very big hot button issue in the courts. Uh, we saw Arkansas you know, experiment with this and throw 18,000 people off of their uh, Medicaid rolls. Um, and this was a big, this is a big policy debate about whether or not that's an appropriate use of the Medicaid waiver process, whether states can do this under the Medicaid, Medicaid Act. And it was about to be heard by the Supreme Court at the end of this month on, on March 29th. And just yesterday, um, the Supreme Court actually announced that it's canceling the hearing and oral argument on the case because early on, the Biden administration started the process, sent letters to all the states that had existing approved work requirement waivers to say that we are going to start the process of undoing these work requirements. Um, and we can't, again, we can't just yank our approval overnight, partly because of some, some of the the sort of gumming up the works that the, that the Trump administration did on the way out the door, um, really to slow down that process and say our, the work requirement approvals can't be you know, removed overnight by the subsequent administration. They would have to go through this long process that takes up to nine months. 
But the Supreme Court has basically seen the writing on the wall and says there's not going to be a controversy for us to weigh in on if the Biden administration, in fact, undoes all of these Medicaid work requirements. Um, so we're not going to hear the, uh, the case argued uh, before the Supreme Court at the end of the month. So th that was an important step. Uh, something similar happened with something called the public charge rule. Uh, so the public charge rule was this very controversial rule that was actually immigration policy by the Department of um, Homeland Security under the Trump administration that had health impacts in the sense that it told it said to immigrants that if you want to apply for a green card, if you want to come, you know, apply for legal status, or if you want to apply for, you know, just apply for citizenship and you're an immigrant, uh, you you can't have taken advantage of and you can't use any public benefits, meaning food stamps or the Medicaid program. And of course, what this does is it sends a huge chilling you know, message to the immigrant communities, don't use Medicaid, even if you're eligible, because if you do and you ever are up for uh, to you know, secure your immigration status, then it's going to be held against you. And so the public charge rule was seen as a you know, certainly by Medicaid providers and hospitals and safety net hospitals that require Medicaid payment uh, to stay afloat, this was seen as a, a, a significant effort to undermine the reach of the Medicaid program. The same thing happened, though. The public charge rule was scheduled to be heard this week. Uh, the Supreme Court decided to dismiss the case to, to, to determine the legality of the public charge rule um, because the Biden administration said, we're not gonna defend it anymore. You know, we, we basically switched positions. Um, and so there again, if both sides of the uh, parties, if both parties to a controversy agree there's no controversy, um, then the Supreme Court arguably doesn't have any reason to hear the case. Um, so these are the types of actions that the Biden administration could take right away and has done. Um, and some of the other ones that the, um, uh, that Jonathan pointed out that there are, you know, lots of steps to start to undo the rules that undermine the pre-existing pro condition protections and allow the sale of skimpy plans. Those were done through rulemaking under the prior administration, so they're going to have to be undone through rulemaking as well. So that's still forthcoming, but we would expect that to happen under the Biden administration HHS. Um, and of course, California versus Texas, the, the, you know, you might be wondering, well, why if the Supreme Court can just decide not to hear the Medicaid uh, work requirement case or the public charge case, why can't we do that with the California versus Texas case? Um, because the Department of Justice also reversed its position on the Affordable Care Act challenge. The prior Trump administration had agreed with the uh, Republican state challengers saying that the Affordable Care Act was unconstitutional. Um, however, the case was heard, the oral arguments were already heard back in November, right after the election. It's been fully briefed. Um, and the parties to the case, it's not really against the federal government. So they can't unilaterally decide to drop the case by switching their, uh, their position on the, the legal issues, because it's really a, a case between the, you know, the states that are defending it, the Californias of the world, and the states that are challenging it, the Texases. Um, so that case is you know, unlikely to be, you know, dropped from the Supreme Court's uh, opinion calendar unless the Congress, and I don't think it necessarily has the ability to do so uh, politically, but unless Congress were to step in to moot the case through legislation by, you know, by making, there are lots of, a few handful of changes that the Congress could do in a sentence, essentially, to make the issue, the legal issue in the California versus Texas case go away. Um, but for a lot of the political reasons that Jonathan pointed out, um, including the filibuster and all the other requirements, some of these even one sentence changes are unlikely to happen politically. Um, and so I think we're likely to see the Supreme Court weigh in. And I agree with Jonathan, most you know, folks who listen to oral argument and are watching the case anticipate that the Supreme Court will uphold the Affordable Care Act and not strike it down. All right, so beyond reversing Trump administration policies, the Biden team quickly sought to restore and return us to some of the pre-Trump uh, status quo in terms of the Affordable Care Act. For example, restoring funding and outreach uh, and funding for the Navigator program for the ACA marketplaces, which were axed to almost nothing by the Trump administration. Also reopening the Affordable Care Act marketplaces for a special enrollment period uh, that lasts from you know, February until May uh, in response to the pandemic largely, but also just to sort of give people an, a way into the marketplaces if they don't have an, a, a good source of coverage otherwise. And in the first two weeks that the special enrollment period was available, over 200,000 people signed up across the 36 states that use healthcare.gov. So that, you know, the word is getting out and people are taking advantage of this. 
Um, and then there are other things that the, you know, the Biden administration is doing to restore sort of the Obama era uh, interpretations of the Affordable Care Act, including uh, rules to prohibit, starting to move toward rules to prohibit discrimination in healthcare based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so the Obama administration had interpreted the uh, section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, which is the healthcare anti-discrimination section passed by the Affordable Care Act, uh, to basically prohibit healthcare discrimination against LGBTQ people on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And the Trump administration basically reversed that policy and said, no, the, uh, there is no prohibition against such discrimination because the only prohibition under the law is discrimination on the basis of sex. And that's not how we interpret uh, sex discrimination. Of course, last summer, the Supreme Court announced a landmark case in Bostock versus Clayton County, which determined that discrimination against LGBTQ individuals under civil rights law is discrimination on the basis of sex. And so uh, in some ways, the, the you know, what the Biden administration is doing to sort of realign um, healthcare anti-discrimination law with this sort of larger civil rights uh, decision is was sort of happening anyway. It probably would have happened um, eventually, but they're sort of accelerating that process and restoring that interpretation under the law. So those are the, the sort of just, pat, you know, fixing the broken you know, the, the damage done by the prior administration. There have also been some ways that the Biden administration, of course, is now reinforcing and building upon the Affordable Care Act itself. And as Jonathan pointed out, this is unique in the sense that this is the first time we've ever seen in the 10 years, 11 years since the Affordable Care Act was passed, a significant effort to build upon and reinforce some of the known holes, gaps, and shortfall, shortcomings of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so, the biggest ones here are the ones that uh, Jonathan put on the slide, but really they, when it comes to coverage, there are three ways that most people get their coverage. They either get it through the, their employer, through employer-sponsored health insurance, it's about half the population, or if they get private insurance on the marketplaces or in the individual market, that's the, you know, another smaller but still significant way people get coverage. And then public coverage, and particularly Medicaid um, and Medicare are the biggest sources of public coverage. And the American Rescue Plan uh, passed you know, just a couple of days ago and signed into law are contains significant efforts to increase support for people in all of those segments of the insurance market. So on the marketplaces, it ended what is known you know, colloquially as a subsidy cliff for those who earn more than 400% of the federal poverty level. So these are sort of middle income families who essentially had no help to go buy insurance coverage on the marketplaces and were priced out through the premium increases that had happened over the course of the last few years. Um, and so what now we see is that the American Rescue plan limits ACA premium costs if you're shopping on the marketplace to 8.5 of household 8.5% of household income for the next two years. So this goes through the end of 2022. This is a significant increase in the amount of subsidies and support, and it really um, strengthens the power of the individual marketplaces in the sense that you see some talk amongst the uh, insurance plans that really have, if they had been sitting it out or had left the market and exited as participants are now cont contemplating coming back, it's, it's about to grow um, significantly. And I would imagine, I'd like to hear Jonathan's I thoughts on this, I think because of the endowment effect and the way politics works, once you give this population this type of subsidy support, you can imagine there's going to be a lot of political pressure in the 2022 midterm elections for Congress to extend these subsidies into the future and just not throw people off their insurance, which is how it will be you know, characterized at that point in time when the public health emergency expires um, and when these provisions under the um, ARP expire. Uh, there's also for people who, you know, as Jonathan mentioned, already get their or previously got their coverage through their employer. Um, there is this provide, you know, provision that uh, that pays for COBRA or the extension of your premiums for, to buy your employer-based coverage. If you lose your job, you can pay for the, you know, to keep your insurance plan, and that COBRA coverage is paid for by the the federal government 100% um, for those laid off from their job through the end of September of this year. So it's not a forever uh, subsidy, but it is a way to sort of stabilize people who might still um, be, you know, just say, you know, displaced from their job because of the effects of the pandemic.
And then finally, the I think one of the, the ones that's a big question mark in terms of how many states will take it up, but the Medicaid expansion has been one of the single most important um, ways to not only cover low income people, but to close racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, um, the gaps in healthcare and health, not just access, but actual health outcomes. Um, and so the, the Medicaid incentives to sweeten the pot for the non-expansion states to expand Medicaid, that's a it's a significant financial commitment by the federal government to basically add 5% to the existing 90% federal matching rate, increasing the federal contribution to 95% for two years for any state that newly expands their Medicaid program. Of course, you know there's a lot of debate right now about like, well, if a state didn't expand when it was 100% of federal uh, match, then why would they, you know, take it up now if they've been holding out for political reasons since then? Um, but I think you know a lot of states are seeing their budgets, you know, strapped by uh, the the pandemic, and so it, this might be an ex in a very attractive source of money to supplement their state budgets. Um, and I think, as Jonathan pointed out, the the extension of the um, the Medicaid coverage for postpartum coverage from 60 days to a year could also have a significant uh, effect on uh, not just postpartum health and maternal and child health, but on racial disparities as well, because some of the biggest uh, effects of those racial disparities are seen in the maternal mortality statistics. So, you know, that's the building upon. And I think that that's, it's pretty exciting. I think that, that you know, of course, the American Rescue Plan wasn't just a health, health law, but it was, similar to what we saw in the how the surprise medical billing um, federal law, No Surprises Act, was passed as part of the COVID relief package at the end of 2020 in December. Um, this was passed as part of the American Rescue Plan, part of this like broader anti-poverty and stimulus bill. Uh, it's must pass spending. It's something that can be done through budget reconciliation. And so that seems to be the way to make health policy these days is you have to attach your health policy and tuck it into a must pass spending bill. Um, and that's the only way to get anything done. Um, but there are limits to that strategy. And it means that we have some, um, we may be approaching the end of the ability to pass sweeping reform if that's the only path forward. So that brings us to the bigger question of whether the Biden administration will be able to pursue this bolder health policy agenda um, beyond just reversing Trump policy or restoring and reinforcing this, you know, the ACA to its sort of pre-Trump status quo. Will Biden be able to usher in any sort of sweeping health reform? Um, and what could that look like? Um, and obviously, the, you know, sweeping health reform in the in the election, in the run up to the 2020 election, um, took the form of debates about Medicare for all versus a public option, right? Medicare for all being Bernie Sanders and others single payer plan that would cover everyone with Medicare or a Medicare like plan and replace largely the current fragmented landscape of public and private payers. Um, and the public option, which is the one that you know, candidate Biden adopted or embraced was the idea of providing everyone an option to, to purchase a public plan, a Medicare like, you know, maybe a Medicare Advantage like plan, um, whether on the ACA marketplaces or elsewhere, but just again, not sort of forcing people into the public plan, but allowing them to opt into it uh, over time. And what these two reform concepts have in common is that they are a major structural reform because they would begin to untether or completely untether health coverage from employment. And that was one of the biggest uh, vulnerabilities I think revealed by the pandemic is when your, you know, your coverage is tied to your employment then when there is an economic recession or worse a pandemic caused economic recession, uh, which is a healthcare crisis, then at the same time you're losing your job, you're also losing your coverage. Um, so that's a, a major structural reform that I think there is a, a greater, I don't know if there's a greater political appetite for that, but there's certainly among the public a greater appetite to untether or uncouple health coverage from employment. Um, the second would be, you know, the second major structural reform again is that is aiming more toward the universality that the Affordable Care Act never was able to fully accomplish. And three, um, it would also apply publicly determined rates to what is now the private insurance market. So this is the cost control side. Um, the idea that the private market isn't controlling healthcare costs anywhere near enough, competition isn't really functioning in the healthcare space. Um, and so the only way to do that would be uh, to use the, the great buying power of a public plan like Medicare uh, for all to, to control the rising healthcare costs for everyone in the private market. 
Um, so I think it's tough to imagine a way forward for a federal, uh, certainly before 2022, a federal level of any sort of health reform. I think Medicare for all is already more or less, you know, a, a pipe dream. It's 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 a conceptual end endpoint, but it is not necessarily um, a live policy proposal at this point. Um, for a public option, even that would be very hard to do under current Senate rules regarding the filibuster. Again, Jonathan says it may it's more than just a filibuster. It's actually the politics too, and I think that's that's correct um, because Democrats do control the presidency and the both chambers of Congress, um, it is, you know, certain types of reforms are possible, but other types of reforms are just beyond uh, reach because Democrats only control 50, uh, 50 votes plus uh, Vice President Harris. Um, so 51 votes is not enough to get something sweeping like even a public option uh, to pass through the Senate. So maybe a filibuster reform would change that, maybe not because the politics don't, uh, don't change even if the filibuster goes away. Um, but it takes, you know, the idea that it takes 60 votes to pass anything other than a bill that affects the budget, right, means that the only type of health reform we get are health reforms that directly are spending provisions or tax changes. And that is, it sort of limits how much reform you can do because the healthcare system is complex. It involves a lot of different parties. Um, it involves a lot of behavior changes and nudges. Uh, and regulations, and all, you can't get all of that through uh, the budget reconciliation process and through the rules that require uh, the bill to actually affect the budget in order to pass through the budget reconciliation process. Um, so even though we saw Congress just pass the American Rescue Plan, so we may have some hope that there is the ability to, to pass bold new policy, not there was zero Republican support for that. Um, to the, for that bill and it did pass through the reconciliation process. So again, once you run up against the limits of the reconciliation process, you run up against the limits of what, what is possible for health reform um, through Congress. So looking ahead, um, it's, it's looking not particularly promising that the, the Biden administration could get sweeping health reform through Congress under cu the current rules and the current sort of political makeup of the Senate. But there is another way um, and that is if, you know, even under this, the current status quo, one alternative path to more structural and sweeping reform may be actually through the states. And so here's what I mean by that. In the United States, we have a federalist system, which is the system in which the power to enact policy and govern is divided between the national government and the states. And one of the benefits, of course, of federalism is the laboratory of the states. We can test policies at the state level. And if we can establish a proof of concept there, the next step is, is often federal reform or national reform. So for example, the Affordable Care Act was patterned off of the Massachusetts health reform in, of 2006. Romney Care was the precursor to Obamacare um, that established the Massachusetts Health Connector, your exchange in Massachusetts. Uh, so similarly, you know, we actually see this happening in other countries with a federalist system. So Canada um, established its single payer system, confusingly called Medicare, um, at the national level after one province, Saskatchewan, proved it could be done at the provincial level level. Um, so sometimes it's not just one state proves it and then the next step is, is national reform. It takes sometimes more than one state. In the case of surprise medical billing, 33 states passed laws protecting patients from surprise medical bills before Congress finally got the political will to pass the federal surprise billing ban in December. Um, but what the benefit of that is, is that we actually get to benefit from a number of diverse state experiments about how to, you know, how to solve this policy problem. Um, and if we can learn from that, sometimes it does shape the ultimate uh, national uh, policy. So it is possible that one, it's not, you know, one route to national reform is for a state to do it first. Um, the political will in some states is actually quite high to to, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is higher and it's easier to kind of pass something um, systemic in a state like Oregon or, you know, even a state like New York that has been debating it. But there are there are ways that states can make further strides and start the experimental debate about what's possible um, before the national government. However, states face additional barriers to passing state level reforms. 
Some of these are fiscal, right? States cannot borrow, they cannot deficit spend, so they cannot raise the funds necessary um, like the federal government. So they are highly dependent on a flow of federal funds to fund any you know, sweeping reform at the state level. And then there are legal barriers. So if you need that federal those federal dollars to come into the state, um, states are however limited by the variety of federal laws that govern those federal funds, whether it's the Medicare laws, the Medicaid laws, the Affordable Care Act law, um, and also ERISA, which is the, gov the law that governs employee benefits. And these really constrain the degrees of freedom states have to design a single payer or a public option plan or any other sweeping type of reform. I've done some research looking at state single payer and public option proposals um, and found that since in the decades since the ACA was passed, um, there's been quite a bit of state action in the sense that legislators in 21 states have introduced 66 single payer unique single payer bills. That's a lot more activity at the state level than we generally hear about. On the public option front, 20 states have introduced 38 unique public option bills, including one in Washington state um, that was actually signed into law and, and went into effect this year. So where does the federal government come in? Although a lot of policy innovation in healthcare is happening at the state level, uh, the federal government can do a lot to either grease the skids or throw sand in the gears of the states. And the first and easiest thing that the Biden administration could do here would be for HHS to adopt a policy to approve very broad uh, or comprehensive waivers under the Affordable Care Act, under Medicare and Medicaid for states to pursue systemic health reforms and avoid some of the legal barriers of existing federal law when they're trying to pursue either a single payer or a public option at the state level. Remember I said that federal laws create barriers because of these legal requirements, but a lot of these laws also contain authority um, for the federal government, HHS usually, to waive these legal re requirements when the state can show that it's going to abide by certain guardrails to ensure the maintenance of key consumer protections, key coverage goals, um, and other types of things to protect program beneficiaries. But the waiver authority could be combined and used to enable states to access streams of federal funding in the Affordable Care Act to make the premium tax credits that are now bigger um, to allow that flow of funds to flow into the state um, and state to keep it to use to fund this larger systemic reform. Um, also Medicaid matching funds could be, uh, could be loosened, the restrictions on Medicaid matching funds could be restrict, loosened through the waiver process um, and also Medicare payments. So the idea of combining all of these into a single public pool um, that combined you know, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act marketplaces and even some employer-based plans um, would be the goal. The key exception to this concept of a waiver though is ERISA. There is no waiver in ERISA, which means it's harder for states to tap into the big and extremely important employer-based healthcare coverage market with their reforms. I've written about how it's possible, but states really need to turn somersaults to do it. It's very complicated because of ERISA's restrictions on state health plan regulation, but it is somewhat possible um, to, to do. And then the other step that the federal government could take would be for Congress, if it can't do its own national reform, it could pass a law amending ERISA and these other healthcare statutes like the Affordable Care Act, Medicare and Medicaid to create this an omnibus waiver program for states to um, apply for to pursue more sweeping health reforms. Um, there have been a few proposals in Congress to do this, um, but they, you know, I think they should be revived, particularly if it doesn't look like sweeping national reform is actually going to be possible in the near term. Um, of course, any congressional action is going to run into the same political constraints um, that Jonathan mentioned earlier. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop there. I'm not really going to talk about the smaller and somewhat insignificant, although not always insignificant category of policies that the Biden administration might retain from the Trump administration, but I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A. Great, thank you both for terrific presentations. <clears throat> I'd like to start out with a question for both of you. Um, so through both of your talks, I think we've honed in on two primary approaches that the Biden administration can take to improving the ACA, and, and those are executive orders and legislation. And so I'm curious as to your thoughts as to which of the early actions from the Biden administration, either through executive order or through provisions in the COVID Relief Act, will have the greatest short-term impact. 
I'll go, I guess I can go first. I think um, oh, it's a tough, a tough call. I think the answer is a lot. Can I take a lot as an, as an answer? Um, but I think really, you know, the, um, there are a lot of people um, who are unemployed and really don't have affordable options for health insurance. And so the, the extension of COBRA provisions um, as well as the um, enhanced subsidies, I think are gonna make a big difference. Is it gonna solve all that ails American healthcare um, and the Affordable Care Act? No. Um, are a lot of people gonna get coverage that they would not have gotten absent those provisions? Absolutely. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And I think that the other, um, some of the things in the background, like, you know, just reopening, the marketplaces, uh, you know, advertising that it's available coupled with the enhanced subsidies, I think will also just sort of give people a way um, to get essentially, you know, I think a lot of people are eligible for free healthcare on the on the marketplaces. Um, and so getting the word out about that and reopening the marketplaces will be big. But I also think that some of the biggest changes are, you know, the things that that don't sort of tinker with the, the individual market, although I think that's one, one place to, to go. But I think that the potential for the Medicaid, you know, if there's any way to get the holdout states to expand Medicaid, and I don't know if it's going to happen, I think that would make a huge, huge impact in terms of just the health outcomes, healthcare access, reducing racial disparities. I mean, that has the potential to be a game changer, again, if it works. Absolutely. Um, if anyone in the audience has questions, please do type them into the q and I'm going to get to those next. But I have one other question that I'd like to ask. Uh, given that you both have such extensive experience in the ACA uh, since its passage, have written extensively on various aspects of the law, um, I, I'd like to put yourselves, you, you can take your choice, but uh, if you could put yourself in the Oval Office, what executive order would you draft first? Or if you were in charge of reforming the ACA through legislation, which would be the first major structural imp improvement you would implement? I think there's a limit to what you can do with the executive order. Um, and I think frankly, Biden, President Biden's done all the things, all, you know, not, not that he, uh, not that there's anything left that couldn't still be done, but I think in terms of undoing the damage, uh, some of it can't be done through executive order, but it's underway through rulemaking, um, things like fixing the family glitch, you know, but these again are tinkering on the margins, um, not that it doesn't matter tremendously to the people who are affected by it, um, but I don't think that you could structurally change the Affordable Care Act through executive order, um, nor should should we be able to structurally change uh, something that is, a, you know, a, st a statutory framework, frankly, through executive order. Um, but in terms of what I would do if I were in Congress, um, I mean, I guess I'd push for a, a public option. Yeah, I think um, I would want to have a wand not an executive order, because I think as Aaron just described, I mean, it, it's kind of hard because the Biden administration is done, as Aaron just said, a, lo a lot of what is the low hanging fruit and not to suggest that it was easy because, um, but they've done a lot of the things that you would sort of do in the ACA fix up operation. And then the, the levels of difficulty for anything else really get steep. I agree on the family glitch, that would make a big difference. Um, but otherwise I would ask the first thing I would do, I don't know if you can get this in the Oval Office, but I'd get on the uh, phone to Hogwarts and I'd say, give me a wand and I'd start waving it around US healthcare, changing as much as I could as quickly as possible. Great. Uh, we've got a question in the Q&A here. And I think uh, the, the key here is that they're drawing a parallel to other industries. So they note that in many states, and I think in most states, drivers are required to have some sort of liability insurance. And uh, the question relates to whether or not you think it would be possible to actually require some sort of minimal basic level, at the very least, potentially hospitalization insurance coverage. Can we create some sort of low-hanging baseline that would uh, cover the majority of costs for some of the uninsured populations? 
Well, the policy of requiring people to have insurance is the individual mandate, and, the, and that exists at the state level. In Massachusetts, it exists, right? Um, you, you, you have an individual mandate in Massachusetts to maintain a minimal level of coverage or else pay a penalty. Um, and many states had put in place a sort of a state individual mandate when the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate became uh, zeroed out and unenforceable. Um, so I think that that is that already exists as a policy option that states could do. I don't know how much it actually changes enrollment. I don't know, Jonathan, if you've seen data on that. I don't know if it has a big impact. I think the thing is people actually want coverage. They don't not want it. Um, there are very few people who uh, who just morally object, you know, object to having coverage. I think the thing is, if you make subsidy, if you make the marketplace you know, robust enough, and you actually subsidize people, you, you only need two of the three legs of the stool, you don't need a mandate um, to get people into the market and to get coverage. Um, the problem is, for a lot of the sort of remaining uninsured, it's not that they're holding out because they don't want insurance, um, they're holding out because they can't afford it, because they, you know, make too much, um, and are beyond the subsidies, or they make too little, and they're in a state that didn't expand Medicaid, or they're an undocumented immigrant, and nothing applies to them. Yeah, I, I would just say ditto to what Aaron said, and, and just add that um, politically mandates are difficult. It's it's punitive, and so the politics of mandates are you know the the ACA's penalty was actually not that large um, uh, in the context of health insurance, and you saw how much political trouble we had abiding by that. Um, so it's it, it's just it's difficult to think of it in that way. Now there is an alternative formulation, which is um, we essentially require workers to participate in Medicare and in social security. So social insurance is, is another way of thinking about mandates, um, less in a punitive way and more in a communitarian way and a contributory way. And that, that's why I think it has appealed to a lot of people in health policy as well. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the audience here. So the ACA originally included the CLASS Act which was aimed at increasing funding for home and community-based care and which would have enabled more elders to age in place. Um, unfortunately, the policy of favoring institutional care over community-based care has proven to be deadly, quite literally, to elders during the pandemic. Uh, so the question is, are there any indications that the new administration will attempt to significantly reform long-term care policy? I haven't heard anything, Erin. Have you heard anything about what what Biden's plans are? No, I haven't heard anything either. I mean, there is some uh, direct funding in the American Rescue Plan. You know, again, this is sort of short term, not long term reform um, for community based health care. However, I don't think that you know the Class Act and long term care in general. I mean, if we think regular health reform is hard, I think long term care is really, really hard. It's just extremely expensive. The market is super dysfunctional. Um, and it's not. So I think it's, it's, if anything, the idea that there was something like it in the original Affordable Care Act, and then it just, it just got killed. Um, you know, Jonathan's talked about some of the other provisions of the Affordable Care Act that have, that have gotten killed along the way. Um, but I think the Class Act was just really hard. Like, and I don't know whether there's any appetite right now in the Biden administration. If there is, they're not, they're not trumpeting it. They're not, um, because it's, they're probably sort of still trying to work it out. Great, we have a brief clarifying question here. What is the family glitch that you mentioned? So the family glitch is part of the uh, the rules for in terms of calculating your subsidy eligibility um, is based on your income, your family income, um, but or your income. But in terms of the family glitch, some of the, the way the rules are calculated, really uh, what counts as affordable coverage to you is based on your own individual income and um, and not your costs to the, your cover your whole family. Um, and so obviously family coverage is significantly more expensive than individual coverage. And so any rule that bases your subsidy level or your calculation of affordability on the individual costs when someone is really buying family coverage uh, basically grossly underestimates the amount of subsidy you would need. And so uh, that has made it really unaffordable for a lot of families to access the subsidies that they need to buy 
coverage on the exchange. Yeah, just to give um, an example. So here at the University of North Carolina, our health insurance is subsidized as North Carolina state employees, but there's really not a subsidy for family coverage. So if you have somebody who's working at the University of North Carolina and let's say their um, partner or spouse has a job that does not have health insurance in it, technically that um, partner or spouse is eligible to join the University of North Carolina family plan. But as Aaron just indicated, it's super expensive because the University of North Carolina is not subsidizing it. And so a lot of um, uh, employees at uh, University of North Carolina who are not well-paid just can't afford to do that. And you would think, well, okay, they can go on the ACA marketplaces and get coverage. But in fact, the way um, the rules were interpreted during the Obama administration, they're ineligible to qualify for subsidies. So it, it, it really is a policy that um, hopefully they're gonna be able to revise. It's hurting a lot of families right now. Great. So there's a question here uh, that relates to high premiums and subsidies. Um, so maybe you can give us an indication. I mean, I, I have a sense of it, but I'd like to, to hear more about what what happens to those folks that are potentially right on the cusp of getting uh, access to health insurance exchanges, but may not have uh, the resources to fully pay for premiums for co-pays, that sort of thing. What sorts of uh, assistance do they get from the federal government and from states to to help? Because I get the sense that Medicaid, you know, a lot of the costs are covered. And so there's not much of an individual uh, contribution when you're in the Medicaid program. And then there's a sizable jump in terms of the amount uh, individuals have to contribute. Even, even if it's not, you know, tremendous, it, it can certainly be impactful. I'm wondering, where can we smoothen that transition and what's been done to attempt to smoothen that transition? So um, you're right that you know, Medicaid um, by statute um, doesn't have much in the way of, co of cost sharing because it shouldn't because these are really low income folks. Um, and so if you look at the, um, the sort of next step of, above Medicaid would be to get heavily subsidized plans on the marketplace. Um, and I think the problem is for a lot of low income people, even modest co-payments um, can um, be really difficult to pay. And I remember I was part of a study years ago looking um, at Medicaid in Oregon. And when they raised the premium, not even by that much in an Oregon Medicaid expansion, they lost tens of thousands of enrollees. Um, so really uh, dollar amounts that may not matter to people who make $75,000 a year, they're going to matter a lot um, to people who make 20,000, 25,000, 30,000 a year. Um, I think what you can do to smooth that out is what they just did actually in this legislation, which is to really try and increase the um, subsidies for people who are, um, they did it up to really increased it up to 150% of the federal poverty level, which these days would be what somebody makes $18,000 or so around there. Um, so I, th I think it's that, that population that's just makes a bit too much money to qualify um, um, for Medicaid um, that you've really got to try and work on their premiums and deductibles. But I, I do want to add this, that we, you know, we make a mistake in U.S. health policy. We divide Americans into two which is the insured and the uninsured. And we don't spend nearly enough time talking about the underinsured. And this is not just a problem for low-income Americans. There are um, millions of middle-class Americans who are basically one family illness away from discovering that their insurance isn't very good and they're not gonna be able to afford the cost of their care. And um, while what was just done um, helps address some of those issues, in the ACA, uh, as Aaron pointed out before, you know, most Americans, working age Americans, don't get their coverage from the ACA. Most of them are getting it through their employer and their deductibles have been going up and up and up. So one of the issues I think um, had resonance in the last campaign and continues to uh, be something that needs action. And that is what do we do about the underinsured in this country, not just in the ACA, what do we do about the underinsured who have employer sponsored? insurance. Yeah, I would, I would agree with everything Jonathan just said and just say that the American Rescue Plan does contain a lot of the smoothing and it extends it up beyond, you know, 
400%, which was a, a cliff before, um, in terms of cost sharing subsidies. If you're unemployed, for example, you get basically a zero, you get a free health plan um, under the American Rescue Plan. So, you know, the there are things that are that that are being tested in, you know, in this in this plan, but it's time limited and it really doesn't touch what Jonathan said is the the big the big problem is which is just commercial insurance in general, whether it's through the employer um, or otherwise, is is becoming unaffordable to most, you know, or, ordinary families. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, a couple of uh, fun questions to wind us down here. Uh, the first comes from a former student of yours, uh, Dr. Oberlander, and I'm going to open it up to both of you. But the, the question is, which 1980s music video best encapsulates the current state of healthcare politics? Wow, okay, so some, a lot of you at this point are wondering what kind of classes I teach here at the University of North Carolina. So I should um, give some context that in, my, um, in one of my classes on healthcare reform, I make use of the big video board, or these days the small laptop Zoom board, and I show a 1980s music video every week. And um, true story that once one of my colleagues and I were walking down the street and a student stopped me and said, I wanted to tell you how much I learned in your class. And I felt great. And then um, they said, I, you know, I learned so much about those music videos. And my colleague asked me, what's the title of your course again? So that's a really hard, um, that's a really hard question. I don't know off the top of my head, um, which 80s music video I would, I would pick to, um, to summarize um, where we are right now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to think, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave it unanswered. I'm gonna have to think a little more about that. All right, and uh, if, if you have a, a music video in mind, Professor Fuzzy Brown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's an 80s music video, I'm trying to think, um, yeah. Well, I've got a 70s. Let me just give a 70s song. This is what I think about as we get to the end of this week and we think about, you know, U.S. healthcare policy is um, it's full of failure and disappointment and frustration. And those of us who are in it just, you know, deal with this so often. And I think this has been a good week. Uh, yeah. Did it solve everything? No, but this has been a good week. So I'm just going to offer everybody the chance to listen to a little reggae going into the weekend and think about um, Bob Mar Marley's song, Positive Vibrations, and just carry that forward. I was going to suggest Sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be good. And that's one of the videos I shared in my class, actually. So yeah, I was going to suggest we didn't start the fire, but I think that's a little too dour for the current moment. Yeah, I didn't want to go if it's the end of the world as we know it either. Um, so... All right, terrific. And I think we've got uh, maybe one more minute left. And I'll tell you what I do in my classes. I I have a Twitter hashtag in every class, and I have the students engage on Twitter and engage in conversations. I try to share those tweets in class, share content that's relevant to ongoing uh, current uh, political debates. Uh, so I'd love to have your uh, one tweet summary that encapsulates the past, present, and future of the Affordable Care Act. Erin, do you want to take a stab? I don't know if this is literally a one tweet summary. Um, but I think this week we, you know, we did see the first big strengthening or reinforcement of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I, my small, again, caveated prediction um, is that these, these additional benefits are very sticky. They're hard to undo once you give them to people. So hopefully that lays the groundwork for um, future reform. But it's gonna be hard. I would say, um, and I'm a relative newcomer to Twitter, so I'm still, you know, as a political scientist, I'm used to um, doing short, thing, short things to me mean like 5,000 words. So it's a little bit of a difficult <laughs> format for me. But um, I would say um, um, lots of progress, long way to go. Right, well, thank, thank you both very much. And thank you, Michael, for, uh, for moderating the session. Um, we will see everybody next month. Uh, and uh, we will, you know, maybe by then we'll have a decision from the Supreme Court, who knows. But uh, we'll see you next month for the uh, session on, on prisons uh, and, and prison healthcare. Uh, again, 
Dr. Zoblander and Fusey Brown, thank you very much for joining us. Really, really great comments, really interesting uh, hour and a half. Take care, everybody. <laughs>